channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericabusiness.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Like a chrysalis, we're emerging from the economy of the Industrial Revolution, an economy confined to and limited by the Earth's physical resources into the economy in mind, in which there are no bounds on human imagination, and the freedom to create is the most precious natural resource. Welcome to the Soul of Enterprise, Business and the Knowledge Economy, sponsored by SAGE, supporting small and medium-sized businesses by creating greater freedom for them to succeed. I'm Ed Kless with my friend and co-host, Ron Baker, and on today's show, we are interviewing Anthony Clark. Well, welcome to the Soul of Enterprise, Anthony. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ron. Happy to be here. Okay. Well, let me let let's let's do full disclosure here um, because I'm I know I'm going to break down at least once. I'm I, I said Anthony Clark, and I you notice I even stumbled on that at the very beginning, and that is because Tony and I go back to high school. So <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> while he is officially Anthony for this interview, uh, I will probably slip up more than once. But uh, Anthony, you have written an absolutely fascinating book that both Ron and I can't wait to get our hands on. And this is a rare occurrence for us because usually when we have a guest, we have absolutely, as Ron likes to put it, marinate in their work for weeks before. But we are excited to have you on, uh, and your book was just released earlier this week, and we are are thrilled. It's called The Last Campaign, How Presidents Rewrite History. And I'm wondering if you could just give us some some quick background on yourself and also the book. Well, I started out wanting to write a book about the history of presidential libraries, just as a private citizen, an average individual who thought, uh, you know, they were fascinating uh, institutions. I'd been to three of them. I started uh, looking into it while I was in a political science graduate class at Appalachian State University in North Carolina. And uh, I really thought, boy, this is, this is an interesting topic. Let me look into it. And I saw a video of Bill Clinton during the 1996 election where he said, you know, unless I run for school board one day, this is my last campaign. And I thought, no, your last campaign is just like your predecessors when you build your library and you run for posterity. So I explored that idea in a, in a paper, and my professor at the time said, hey, this could be a book. And at the time, I just thought I would just explore really the history of them and what happened. Uh, unfortunately, what occurred in my research uh, not only significantly changed the course of the book, it significantly changed the course of my life. I, I ended up, uh, at the end of this uh, journey, running oversight and investigations of the presidential libraries for the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee. And that took you to and, – and we've seen some, some videos of, of you uh, doing that. Well, you worked for a congressman, correct? I did. Well, what happened was I had started giving some lectures and writing some articles because I, I hit a brick wall with the National Archives. They didn't want me to see their own records about presidential libraries. And uh, I couldn't get anywhere with FOIA. I couldn't get anywhere with uh, uh, asking nicely. And so I decided to go public. And once I'd gone public, I – I started uh, getting on some radar screens in Washington, and one of those screens was the chairman of the subcommittee that oversees the presidential libraries and the National Archives. And he had asked me to come in to consult on a few ideas, maybe give him some suggestions for hearings. And uh, one thing led to another, and I got offered the job to, to run those hearings. And then, therefore, the book was put on hiatus for some time, right? Yes, I had to actually agree to stop researching the book because with my responsibilities on the Hill, I had access to records and access to officials in the archives that I wouldn't have had as a private citizen. So I stopped, not only did I stop all formal research, but I stopped working on the book even on nights and weekends for four years. And then uh, we pick, picked it up after that and then started a Kickstarter campaign, one of the few Kickstarter campaigns that actually got funded. <laughs> yeah, the, there's only about, uh, I think it's 38% of publishing projects on Kickstarter actually reach their funding goals. I had been away for so long that half of the libraries had made major changes 
and a new library for George W. Bush had come into the system. And so I needed to raise some funds to go back out and finish that final research and complete the book. And we are a bit farther afield on the soul of enterprise. Usually we focus on the business side of things. So if, if you wouldn't mind, so just, just to make this a connection point for the rest of our audiences, let's talk a little bit about the businesses of presidential libraries. How, how does that work? Yeah, well, the, the, the narrative that the National Archives says is that the president raises some funds, uh, builds a library, and then donates it to the government. And the government operates it in perpetuity. But that really doesn't tell the whole business side of it, because when Franklin Roosevelt invented this idea, his notion was to have a single location to preserve his records and his collections, because previous presidents had had a lot of problems with that. And so he, he built a modest fieldstone structure on his property, donated it and the land surrounding it to the government, and you know thought that it would be maintained by taxpayer funds on the archival side, and maybe the small museum portion would be uh, uh, funded by, you know, and the nickels and quarters and dimes that people would pay uh, as the advi- admission fees continue. Now, cut to today, where presidents raise half a billion dollars to to fund their to build their presidential libraries, and then we as a nation spend a billion dollars a decade operating the libraries. And the the uh, what we're looking at now in in President Obama's site selection process for his library is fascinating because there are cities across the country vying to get this. Uh, there's politics at play in Chicago where the mayoral race is hinging on which candidate would be better suited to bring the presidential library to Chicago. That's, oh, wow. the, that's the major issue in the runoff campaign between Rahm Emanuel and Chuy Garcia, which is, uh, you know, every, every organization, every university, every city, every village that's wanted a presidential library over the past 70 years has thought it would be a good thing for them. But now I think people are, people's expectations are even greater and wildly inaccurate than they are with uh, you know, municipal sports stadiums. Well, I was going to say, it's sort of like the Olympics, right? I mean, at a certain point, the, some of these places end up net losing money. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and you know, over the years, there have been examples of public money being, being spent to build the presidential library, as long as it's not federal. So the state of Texas spent $18 million in, in the early 70s to build the Lyndon Johnson Library, and the state of Kansas had funded the Eisenhower Library, uh, Texas A&M University in, in uh, College Station that, that uh, hosts the George Bush Library. So it's, it's not an unprecedented thing to have a mix of public and private money, but what is unprecedented is to actually see a return. The, the only presidential library that's seen a positive economic return is the Bill Clinton Library, and he had selected a, an area in, in Little Rock, which was kind of a derelict warehouse district. It was at the end of a main street that had seen better days, and that's, that whole area, the River Market District, has come back, and not just because of the Clinton Library, but the Clinton Library then attracted Heifer International to put their headquarters there. Uh, the area was cleaned up as a presidential park. Uh, there was more tourism, but it, by and large, Here's the, here's the catch-22. The Herbert Hoover Library is in West Branch, Iowa, and it's the least attended of all the presidential libraries. But it's one of the most attended tourist attractions in all of Iowa. And so are, you know, are, are people coming to Iowa to see the Hoover Library? Probably not. But people who are in Iowa are going to see the Hoover Library. So in Chicago, are people going to come to Chicago if the Obama Library is built there? Maybe. For a certain number of years, there's the kind of look-in crowd that, that there's a surge in attendance. But after that, I don't think it's going to be the main focal point for Chicago tourism. You just got me thinking it would be interesting now that uh, George Bush's library is here in Dallas. Over what t- period of time does the the attendance in that decline and the Kennedy assassination, the Sixth Floor Museum, become more popular again? <laughs> yeah, well, to, to give you a statistic, it took them more than a year – at the, at the George W. Bush Library to reach the 500,000th visitor. Uh, and the, the expected attendance before it was open was 800,000 for the first year. So they didn't meet that, that goal. The, the, the largest, you know, some of the presidential libraries over the years have played uh, some creative games with counting attendance. So the, the one that I consider to be the most credible attendance record was set at the Dwight Eisenhower Library in Abilene, Kansas, in the year after his death. 
So about 750,000 people came to pay their respects to Ike. He was buried on the grounds of the library. Since that time, no presidential library has come within 200,000 visitors of hitting that, hitting that goal. Wow. And, and, and now, with, go ahead. Uh, and with Chicago, I was going to say that the expectation isn't just about numbers. You know, the National Archives estimates that between $100 and $200 per visitor day is added to a local economy if they have a presidential library. But if I'm driving out to Independence, Missouri, to see the, the Hoover, uh, the, excuse me, the Truman Library, I might stay in Independence, I might stay very close by in Kansas City, or I might be on my way, but uh, most of the people coming to the Obama Library in Chicago, once the first or second or third year is done, are going to be school children in, in Chicago, people who live there. They're not going to be dropping a lot of money because they live there. It's not because they're not going to bring that economic boon. Mm-hmm. No, they're, they're going to American Girl, let's face it. <laughs> 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 which is which 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 uh, Anthony is one of our favorite uh, go to experience uh. economy examples. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, I I wouldn't I wouldn't put it past the designers of any new presidential library from taking a cue from those experiences. Yeah, exactly. Maybe they'll have a you know hair care center like they do in American Girl. But um, well, I was going to ask it just uh, g- coming back to some of the, the the history of this. Now, not every president has a library. Is that correct? Some of, uh, clearly, some of the the ones in the eighteen hundreds they don't have a library of their own at this point. Right. I mean, Roosevelt started the official federal system. There had been earlier, like William McKinley, Rutherford B. Hayes. Uh, there's a Calvin Coolidge library, but they're not part of the federal system, and they're not anywhere near the scale of uh, of what uh, you know the National Archives hosts. The, the two closest that are not in the system that are at that scale are the newly opened George Washington Presidential Library at Mount Vernon, and uh, ten years ago the state of Illinois opened the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. Again, those are are not part of the federal system, but yeah, every president since Hoover has one, and. You know, one of the arguments I make in the book is that I, I suggest that President Obama not build a library, or at least not build a library museum like his predecessors. And I say that if an earlier president like Jimmy Carter, who's a one-term president, no federal experience other than presidency, or Gerald Ford, who was, was elected to nothing higher than the House, if they had decided that they would forego building these monumental shrines to themselves, that probably wouldn't have made an impact on their successors. The, the tradition probably would have continued as it is. But if the president who received the most votes in history, the president who raised the most money of any presidential candidate in history, the first African-American president in history, if he decided not to build uh, such a shrine, maybe we'd be able to get a handle on reforming the system. You know, it's kind of like if only Nixon could go to China, maybe only Obama could not have a presidential library. <laughs> I like that. Now, uh, of course, he could almost do it completely virtually, right? At this point, we would think that that most things that would be documented in a library would not be papers and that kind of stuff. Of course, and, and we will ask. I'll ask you about this after our first break, which is coming up here. Except, you know, Hillary took the server off site so for the Secretary <laughs> of State, so we're gonna <laughs> that, that that's got to fit figure into the mix as well. But he could almost do it virtually, right? The first time he ever made a public statement about his library was in 2009, and he said, I maybe won't even build a bricks-and-mortar library. Maybe I'll just put everything online. There you go. Well, we are up against a break here, so we welcome Anthony Clark, author of The Last Campaign. But to get a hold of us at The Soul of Enterprise, you can email us at tsoe at verisage.com. Also, follow us on Twitter at hashtag ask. TSOE, which we do monitor during the show. But we're about to take our first break with our sponsor, Leading Results. Follow us on Twitter at VoiceAmericaTRN. Get the lowdown on guests, new shows, and your favorites. That's VoiceAmericaTRN. Is your website just a brochure, or is it your best salesperson? If your site is not the best lead generation tool you have, we should talk. We are Leading Results. We build websites and marketing programs that impact your bottom line. Using HubSpot or WordPress, we'll create a website and supporting marketing program that gets your business found, converts web visitors to leads, and provides clear tracking on what is and is not working. 
Learn about our team and approach to your success. Visit leadingresults.com slash TSOE to find out more. Have you ever read a book that changed your life? I sure have. But have you ever read a book where the forward changed your life? Me neither. Hello, I'm Greg Kite. I wrote the forward to Ron Baker and Ed Kless's new ebook, The Soul of Enterprise, Dialogues on Business and the Knowledge Economy. The value of this book is found entirely in its forward. So when you buy it, think of it as buying the forward and getting the rest of the book for free. Available now for download exclusively on Amazon.com. Voice America Business Network, the bottom line in business. You are tuned into The Soul of Enterprise with Ron Baker and Ed Kless. To find out more about our show, visit Verisage.com. You may also tweet us at Verisage. That's V-E-R-A-S-A-G-E. Now, back to The Soul of Enterprise. Well, welcome back, everybody. We're here with the author, Anthony Clark. And he's written the book, The Last Campaign, How Presidents Rewrite History, Run for Posterity, and Enshrine Their Legacies. And, Anthony, this is just fascinating because I have to tell you, I've, ever since I attended the uh, the Nixon Library when that opened, and that was in the early 90s, was it not, when that yes. opened? July um, 1990. I've been hooked on presidential libraries, and it's actually on my bucket list to go to all of them. And, and I've hit about 12 of them so far. So I've, I've got a long way to go. <laughs> yeah, I, I learned real quick that you can nail a lot of them in Ohio. <laughs> um, but I guess my, my first question is, wasn't at one point Nixon's library totally privately funded, or was that a misnomer? I thought I read that somewhere in the library. Oh, that's correct. You know, every presidential library since Hoover was built with private or at least non-federal funds, but everyone other than Nixon was donated to the government. Now, you know, obviously, when Nixon resigned in disgrace in 1974, it, the plans for his library were put on hold, and it took him 16 years to find a location. And he, you know, went around the country. The uh, Duke University uh, w- was almost the site of the library, but the faculty and the and the students rejected it. He uh, uh, he got offers from the the city of Abilene, Kansas, which already hosted the Eisenhower Library. In fact, my my favorite uh, um, turned uh, my favorite site that Nixon turned down was that a little city in, in Kansas made a formal offer and said, we'll give you a site for free. Uh, that was the good news. The bad news is that the city was Leavenworth, Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> the actual true story. So that, the, oh, the optics weren't exactly great for, for Nixon. So he finally uh, built the library on a little nine-acre site adjacent to his boyhood home in Yorba Linda, California. Right, and he and he has not donated that back to the federal government like the others have. Well, what happened is he opened it in 1990, and he didn't donate it to the government, primarily because in 1974, uh, shortly after Gerald Ford pardoned Richard Nixon, word leaked that Nixon had made an arrangement with the General Services Administration, which at the time ran the National Archives, to take control and have legal and physical ownership of his records and his tapes. Now, up until that time, presidential records were still considered to be the personal property of the president. So that wasn't necessarily different from his predecessors. What was different was that the agreement uh, formally gave Nixon the right to destroy the tapes after a certain number of years. So Congress stepped in that fall and passed a law, the Presidential uh, Recordings and Materials Preservation Act, that said, no, your papers must stay in the D.C. area, and you may not have access to them uh, without the consent of the National Archives and vice versa. So for, for years, those records were not part of the Nixon collection out, out in California. And it wasn't until 2007 when the National Archives and the Richard Nixon Foundation came together and made a deal to welcome the library into the system. So it's, it's now part of the federal system. The records were transferred from College Park, uh, Maryland, where they had been kept for, for decades. And uh, it's, it's, now a federal, it's now a federal institution. I see. Okay. So when you say that we spend, the taxpayers spend about a billion dollars per decade on these things, are you referring to, I think I read this on your Kickstarter page, you say there's 13 federally run libraries between Hoover and the Bush years? Correct. So that's what we're spending the billion on. It's just those 13? Correct. It's not even for other presidents. And 
And here's my, my, you know, my favorite, or I should say least favorite uh, financial, I mean, uh, not uh, financial, but statistic. Uh, modern presidents open their libraries an average of four years after they leave office. Mm-hmm. But the records of the presidents from Reagan forward will not be open for 100 years or more. Everybody who is listening to this broadcast, in fact, no one listening to this broadcast, will be able to see the records of Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, or Barack Obama. Right, and Anthony, why is that? I mean, isn't there still some documents tied up in the in the JFK library and other libraries that they're not releasing? They're kind of dribbling them out, aren't they? Yes, and so after the Nixon experience with, with uh, his records, Congress passed a law called the Presidential Records Act that declared presidential records are the property of the United States. And so presidents don't have a choice of where they donate their, their records or how they process them. But, uh, but libraries that opened before that are what's called deed of gift. So the, the presidents make a deed to the government and say, here are my records, here's some restrictions on certain one of them. And so the Kennedy Library is, is, a, is a good example of that where there's a, a review committee that determines what can be open and what can be uh, still withheld. Um, the, 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 the assassination materials are, are, are being kept for, I think, 100 years uh, you know, from the public. But the libraries, after the Presidential Records Act, inadvertently the act completely made the situation worse. What they thought they would do is they say, look, after the president leaves office, there's a five-year period under the law where no records can be released. It gives the National Archives time to arrange and describe them and get ready for releasing them. After that five years is over, you can make a FOIA request if the records aren't yet open, because obviously you're not going to open 80, 70 million pages in five years. The records have to be processed for privacy, for national security. There's, there's some exemptions to certain records. The problem is that as soon as a presidential library meets that five-year deadline, people start sending in FOIA requests, and the FOIA backlog starts growing exponentially very quickly. I know of one FOIA requester who requested a document from the George W. Bush Library late last year. It was an unclassified single document, and in February he was informed that it's in the queue and his FOIA request will be fulfilled in approximately 12 years. (laughs) That's for a single document. Wow. And this is why. This is, this is not a, a, a restriction in the law. This is not the limits of the physical universe. This is the, the presidential libraries, the national archives that run them, focus on legacy. They focus on the public side. Museums, speakers, education, public programs, you know, major addresses and events. And so that's where they put the money. So there are archivists at those libraries but there's also museum specialists, museum technicians, curators, public affairs specialists, education specialists, communication specialists, all of whom are working to celebrate the legacy of the president, not to process and release and preserve the records, which is the reason we pay for presidential libraries. Right. You know, Thomas Sowell has made the point, I think it was one of his columns where he said, you know, this idea of presidential libraries is kind of insane. It makes a historian's work much harder to have to run around to get access to all these papers. Why can't they be all stored in one place? And I always thought that was a fair point. But not, not only is it, is it difficult for historians to access the records because they have to travel, but if you wanted to do a comprehensive history of the Vietnam War, you have to go to five presidential libraries. Right. Yeah, you, you know, I, I know that's a big part of your theme of this book because it's in your subtitle that they're rewriting history. And it wasn't at Churchill who, Churchill who said, history will be kind to me for I intend to write it. <laughs> yeah. what, what are some of the ways that the presidential libraries rewrite history uh, other than I know they sanitize? I mean, you go to the Nixon Library and it's somewhat sanitized, although they deal with some of the scandals. But I, I, you know, I, they're adding their own color to it, and they will even admit that. But uh, what are other ways, maybe, that they do it more surreptitiously? Well, they they fall into three categories. Deal with it forthrightly. For example, uh, when when uh, Gerald Ford was planning the renovation of his presidential library, uh, he was meeting with his advisors, and at the meeting was Henry Kissinger, and they found out that they could get the actual staircase from the roof of the United States Embassy in Saigon which was so iconic in the, the oh, images wow. of the fall of Saigon, of the helicopters coming to the roof and taking off the, right. you know, the U.S. And Kissinger said, no, Mr. President, you can't have that in your, in your presidential library. It's a symbol of defeat. And Ford slapped his hand on the conference table and he said, but Henry, 
It's what happened. And today, when you go to visit the Ford Presidential Museum in Grand Rapids, you can see the Vietnam exhibit with the staircase of the U.S. Embassy there. So that's, in my opinion, that kind of straightforward, it's what happened, warts and all, is the least frequent in the modern presidential libraries. The second way is dealing with it by spinning it. So contrary to a lot of people's uh, predicted criticism, the Bill Clinton Library does have the name Monica Lewinsky in its permanent exhibit. But the exhibit isn't titled, you know, uh, My Personal Failings. The, the exhibit isn't titled, you know, Why I Was Impeached. The, the, the exhibit is The Republican Fight for Power. And the context is that they were trying to do what they couldn't do at the ballot box. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, this happened, but you need to see the bigger picture. So there's a spin involved. The third sure. example is by not dealing it, with it whatsoever. I think that every presidential library before it opens, critics start thinking, okay, how will they deal with it? I, I had people asking me before the 2004 opening of the Clinton Library, you know, will Clinton have the blue dress on display? Um, <laughs> you know, b- before the, door, the W Library opened in, in Dallas, people were saying, is there going to be, you know, an Abu Ghraib torture room? Uh, you know, people latch onto those things. And, and, and the, the, the ultra critics want to see how are they going to talk about, how are they going to get out of this? So the way that the Reagan Library decided to get out of Iran-Contra is for 21 years not mentioning it at all. Mm-hmm. Not, not bringing it up, not, not talking about how it was a mistake, or not even trying to defend it. It just wasn't there. Right, just ignore it. You know, it yeah. reminds me, I guess it's not a presidential library per se, but it's FDR's little White House in, in Warm Springs, Georgia. And nowhere I saw in that whole exhibit that they have there does it explain that this was a segregated property. Well, yeah. Yeah, I think because there's a big difference between commemoration and history. And yes. I, have no, I have no issue with a private organization commemorating an individual. That's not my issue. My issue is with that organization deciding what's written as history and then handing it over to a federal government institution that puts its, not only its taxpayer funds into it, but its kind of seal of approval. The, the, the right. history that's displayed at the presidential libraries would never pass muster at the Smithsonian Institution. Gotcha. And, and, and along those lines, do you think it's a good idea for universities to get involved like they have with Bush's library? I mean, because they're supposed to be institutions of, you know, searching for the truth. Yeah, and I think the, the problem, what's, what's interesting is that the reason why the, the Duke University faculty and, and student body were upset about the proposed Nixon Library was because of the museum. But there's an interesting change now in that focus. Uh, I think the concern that I would have and that universities should have isn't so much on the museum, it, but it's on the associated policy centers that are part of the, the modern presidential library. You know, the, the, in 1986, Congress passed a, an amendment to the Presidential Libraries Act limiting the size of the library to 69,999 square feet. <laughs> So what presidents have done since then is to build enormous structures way past that point, but only deed 69,999 square feet to the government. So they get to operate in the space. And at at the George W. Bush Library in Dallas, it's a 250,000 square foot building. The other part of it is being used by the George Bush Institute, by the George Bush Foundation. And then you get into a question of, is the scholarship that's being produced in those think tanks consistent with the universities, like you said, run search for the truth. I think that's a much more problematic uh, issue than whether or not they're hosting skewed museum exhibits. That makes sense. Yep. Okay. Well, Anthony, look, we have to take a break, but this has been an absolutely fascinating discussion, folks. And uh, just to remind you, you can contact Ed or myself at TSOE at Verisage.com. And you can also follow the show live on Twitter at hashtag Ask TSOE, and of course, post our show notes. Uh, on we, we will have those up on verisage.com slash TSOE, and we will link to uh, Anthony's book and his uh, maybe his Kickstarter page as well to give you a little bit more background. I, I found that really fascinating, Anthony, looking at that this morning. Uh, but in the meantime, folks, uh, we want to hear from our sponsor, Azamba. <laughs> Yeah. 
We're making it easier to listen to the Voice America Talk Radio Network live wherever you go on iPhone, BlackBerry, or Android. Download it from the Apple iTunes App Store, BlackBerry App World, or Android Market. What if you could close more business with less effort and do it faster? What could your people accomplish if they had their own personal assistant keeping track of meetings and reminding them of follow-ups? What would it mean to have a perfect view of what your team and your prospects and your customers are doing? What if you could run your business from anywhere? You can have it all. Visit www.azamba.com forward slash soul today to find out how. That's azamba, A-Z-A-M-B-A dot com forward slash soul. Have you ever read a book that changed your life? I sure have. But have you ever read a book where the forward changed your life? Me neither. Hello, I'm Greg Kite. I wrote the forward to Ron Baker and Ed Kless's new ebook, The Soul of Enterprise, Dialogues on Business and the Knowledge Economy. The value of this book is found entirely in its forward. So when you buy it, think of it as buying the forward and getting the rest of the book for free. Available now for download exclusively on Amazon.com. When it comes to business, you'll find the experts here. Voice America Business Network. You are tuned into The Soul of Enterprise with Ron Baker and Ed Kless. To find out more about our show, visit Verisage.com. You may also tweet us at Verisage. That's V-E-R-A-S-A-G-E. Now, back to The Soul of Enterprise. And we're here on The Soul of Enterprise with author Anthony Clark. Anthony is the author of The Last Campaign, How Presidents Rewrite History. And Anthony, I just want to ask you, you did, you've done reviews, obviously, of each of the libraries, and I know taken thousands of pictures, but you also did some research into the history of the libraries themselves. What, what did you find there? Well, the, the research was really where everything changed for the book. Uh, I have been working at the, at the National Archives in College Park, Maryland, for months researching the history of presidential libraries from the perspective of the National Archives. And at the time, the, the Nixon Library was still a, a private organization, so the, those records were at College Park. And, you know, most people who research in presidential libraries don't research the presidential library, they research the president. So I was frequently looking at records that most people had never seen before, and so the archivists weren't as familiar with them. And in, in, the, in the big 1.2 million square foot facility, there's a research uh, room, and inside the research room, there's a consultation room where you can go ask the archivist a question. At the end of every day, for weeks, I would stop in and say, okay, are you sure that that's, this is the only records that you have about the Nixon Library? And, uh, and they said, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, it became kind of a running joke. I would stop by, make it. They would pretend to be frustrated with me making the same joke again. At least I, I think they were frustrated uh, and pretending to be so. But at, at one point, I said, uh, look, this is my last day. Are you sure that these are all the records that you have about the Richard Nixon Library? And they said, yeah. And then I'm walking out, and I could actually see through the glass window. They looked at each other and shrugged, and they said, called out, and they said, well, un- unless, unless you want to look at, there's a couple of boxes called the Nixon Library at Camp Pendleton, but, you know, he, he didn't actually build it there, so you wouldn't want to look at those. That comment completely changed the course of this book. <laughs> and, uh, well, what happened then? <laughs> well, see, the, the story is that everybody knows that Richard Nixon had a hard time finding a place to build his library after he left. And so, like I had mentioned before, it, he was rejected by Duke, the, the folks in Kansas. He even tried to build it uh, north of his, uh, of his home in San Clemente, California, on, on bluffs. And that land is actually still in dispute today. It's, it's a development that never happened from the 80s on. But nobody knows, and what the book reveals for the first time, is that right from the start, at the beginning of his presidency, Richard Nixon started planning his presidential library by stealing land from the United States Marine Corps. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And, and the chapter in the book is called The Secret Nixon Library. And you might know that he had what he called the Western White House, uh, La Casa yep. Pacifica. And mm-hmm. it was on a, a bluff overlooking the Pacific Ocean, and it abutted the largest Marine Corps training base in the world, Camp Pendleton, right. which is 125,000 acres, and at the time was 18 miles of beautiful coastline between San Diego and Los Angeles. 
And once he uh, found that house, he was walking on the beach, and he saw this beautiful land. It was uh, the best surfing beaches in America. It was, uh, although Hawaii might take issue with that, and maybe in the continental United States, there's these beautiful 600-foot cliffs, rolling hills, alluvial plains. It was beautiful. Now, Nixon had not had a good history with presidential libraries. He was vice president when Harry Truman opened his library, but he wasn't present at the uh, ceremonies. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower didn't have him out to Abilene to open his library, even though he had been his vice president. Um, You know, when Herbert Hoover gave the keynote address at the 1960 Republican National Convention that nominated Richard Nixon, Hoover mentioned Richard Nixon's name a total of zero times. (laughs) He didn't have a big fan club in former presidents, and so his idea of, of... commemorating himself and his legacy in his presidential library was informed by all these other people who didn't like him and had these great libraries. So he had to find a place that was better than everyone else and spectacular. And so he found this beautiful location right next to his house. The only problem was that it was on a Marine Corps base and that federal law prohibits you from building a library on federal property. And I detail the the story in the book of how he was able to do this. And he was successful halfway. He was able to get the land temporarily leased to the state of California, but his resignation ended the scheme, and he ended up building his library not on the 4,000 acres and six miles of beach that he illegally took from the Marine Corps. He ended up building it on that nine-acre uh, plot in Yorba Linda, California, next to the freeways and the closely packed houses of Orange County, California. So let's see. The, the, and so you discovered this. They, the, did, the, did the folks at the at the library did they even know it was in those boxes? Is that no. is that why you think you were able to get to it? Yeah, they didn't know it at all, as far as I know. And I was, I, I became very um, concerned that this would leak somehow. And so I had to find ways to be very quiet about it and going through. I mean, we're, we're not talking about a memo or two. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of pages and some bold faced names, including you know, the, the 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 person who worked on it. Uh, most within the White House was John Dean. Mm. And I have uh, a, a memo that John Dean wrote to the president saying, look, this is going to be so controversial and so problematic that we need to stop all overt action on this plan until after the 1972 election. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we're, and, we're, we're diverted. We've got other things to worry about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's the thing. I mean, it was, you see, <laughs> at one point I, I was amazed to be able to see, you know, the Nixon Library has this presidential daily diary. It shows you what the president was doing every minute. And then they have the tape subject logs, which give a, a, an, an idea of what the president and his associates were talking about on the tapes. And at first, I was, I was really astonished that he would be talking about the Pentagon Papers and the Watergate break-in and the Vietnam War. At the same time, during the same conversations, he was talking about his presidential library. Until I realized that these weren't two different things, one important, one not important. He was seeing how he would set up his legacy and how history would view him while he was conducting the business of the presidency. Wow, fascinating. So so now that this is this is revealed and known in the book, every presidential library is going to have facial recognition software with your mug on it. That they're <laughs> gonna, like if you come within 100 yards, they're going to be like, okay, alert. <laughs> well, you know, the, the other astonishing thing I found out in the records is that I did a Privacy Act request on myself because the, the, the National Archives had been keeping me from the records for so long that I wanted to find out what records they held on me. And, and I found out through those records that they were giving a detailed report to the official who ran the presidential library system of every time I entered the National Archives, what boxes I looked at and what folders I looked at, which they've never done on any other researcher. So I wouldn't put it past them to use the, the most modern technology to continue that process. Wow, Anthony, you're probably the only guy who's got his picture in every presidential library rather than the post office is the most one. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like, it's like those things at the grocery stores, you know, do not take a check from this man. No, I, I have to say this really clearly, though, except for, I mean, the officials in Washington are one thing, but the archivist at the presidential libraries, with a singular exception, uh, which I don't discuss in the book, every archivist across the country was scrupulously honest uh, to my knowledge, gave me access to everything that they could legally give me access to, was very helpful, uh, did not display any of the partisan uh, politics that the foundations or the, the officials in Washington do. I just want to be able to make that clear. Right. You, you know, I've had some dealings with the Reagan Library archivist, and he, he just just fantastic, very professional people. Absolutely. I was, I was really impressed by that. And they, and they don't get nearly enough credit because when, whenever there's a story about 
presidential libraries, they talk about, you know, how the Clinton library is withholding this, so the Reagan library is hiding that, and it's really not the archivist at all. Right. You know, that, that Nixon story is fantastic, and I guess it's, and you say it's never been disclosed before. I've never heard of that story at all. Yeah. Are there any other bombshells in your book? Well, there's, there's a, another story very quickly. Um, in 1993, in, with, uh, with 13 hours left in the George H.W. Bush presidency, the archivist of the United States, Don Wilson, signed a secret agreement uh, declaring that the White House computer backup tapes that covered the era of the Reagan and Bush years, which, which included the backup copies of all the Iran-Contra um, emails that were deleted by Oliver North and Admiral Poindexter, were, instead of being presidential records, which they were, the archivist declared them to be the personal property of George H.W. Bush, and he transferred legal and physical custody. Now, when that leaked out two weeks later, there was an outrage, there was a storm of protests. It was eventually nullified by a federal court. But when it came out, the archivist at the time said, well, A, I didn't do anything wrong, and B, I'm resigning to go down to College Station, Texas, to run the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library Foundation. And there was a lot of uh, talk at the time that there was a quid pro quo. You know, here he gets a cushy job. Now, Wilson had spent the previous year under investigation by the Senate, by the FBI, by the Office of Special Counsel. Uh, the Senate dubbed him the case of the absentee archivist. He needed a way out. Uh, he, as I put in the book, he needed an exit strategy. But there's never been hard proof that he was the political person that people were accusing him of. You know, the, the archivist is supposed to be nominated and confirmed in a strictly nonpartisan basis. It's actually spelled out in the National Archives Act. Um, but I found uh, records of his application for the archivist position. Now, the Reagan administration had appointed him after their previous three appointees were uh, turned down or protested because of being too political. And in his application for the job, in his letter, uh, cover letter to the White House, he said, you know, uh, I have this degree, I have that degree, this is what I've done in my life, but what doesn't appear in my resume is my Republican political credentials. And he, decided, and he detailed the campaigns he worked on, the elections he won, and his reference list included 10 Republican uh, major figures, including three U.S. senators, two retired senators, two members of Congress, a pollster, and a lobbyist. And so I detail in the book how this was not only not an apolitical person, but the most political archivist in history that led up to that fateful decision to sign that secret deal. I love it. A f great story. Uh, well, look, we're up against a break, but when we come back, maybe along those same lines, we'll have to ask you about the Hillary uh, email uh, <laughs> situation sure. that's going on. And in the meantime, folks, you can uh, follow the show and get our show notes at verisage.com slash TSOE, and we will link to uh, Anthony's work, and uh, you can check out this book for yourself. I, I, it's going to be wonderful. And in the meantime, you can also contact Ed or myself at TSOE at verisage.com. And now we want to hear from our sponsor, Sage. Become our friend on Facebook. Post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline. Visit Facebook.com forward slash Voice America. Four new employees. A 20% increase in revenue. Being one of the 9 million women business owners in the U.S. These are your proudest numbers, your landmarks of growth and success. Sage helps you achieve business milestones with cloud and software solutions that lead to deeper financial insights. Believe in your numbers. See what Sage can do for your business. Visit believeinyournumbers.com today. Have you ever read a book that changed your life? I sure have. But have you ever read a book where the foreword changed your life? Me neither. Hello, I'm Greg Kite. I wrote the foreword to Ron Baker and Ed Kless's new ebook, The Soul of Enterprise, Dialogues on Business and the Knowledge Economy. The value of this book is found entirely in its foreword. So when you buy it, think of it as buying the foreword and getting the rest of the book for free. Available now for download exclusively on Amazon.com. The business community's first choice in Internet Talk Radio, Voice America Business Network. You 
are tuned into The Soul of Enterprise with Ron Baker and Ed Kless. To find out more about our show, visit Verisage.com. You may also tweet us at Verisage. That's V-E-R-A-S-A-G-E. Now, back to The Soul of Enterprise. And we're back on The Soul of Enterprise with my friend, I'm going to say it one more time, Tony Clark, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and full, full, absolute full disclosure here. Uh, one of the the most. This is in a way one of my my uh, dream dinner conversations is to have Ron and and Anthony together uh, because in. I, I view the three of us as as an honest liberal, an honest conservative, and an honest libertarian. So, the, which is why, why, as you said, we should get this down on tape. This is <laughs> <laughs> unprecedented. <laughs> uh, but I, I really do think that we can all look at the same things and, and respect each other's opinion. But I want to, uh, as I alluded to earlier, ask you about this whole Hillary uh, email situation. And I'm going to like sort of pretend that I'm on Capitol Hill asking you questions. Right? This is how. <laughs> <laughs> going to do this. So, um, uh, Anthony, as a federal employee, uh, were you allowed to have a personal email address just by itself? Yeah, let's, let's be clear about the Federal Records Act. Yes. The Federal Records Act does allow the infrequent, occasional use of a personal email account under two circumstances. One is that the email is forwarded very soon after the email is sent to the individual's federal account. That That is a requirement. Or... The individual's federal account is CC'd or BCC'd on the personal email. And, and the, the example that was used when I was on the Hill for, for, from people explaining this to me is that, you know, if, if you're working in FEMA, uh, the, uh, um, you know, uh, disasters don't always happen between 9 and 5. So you might be woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning, you grab your BlackBerry, you tell your team to get ready, you might be using your personal email account. Gotcha. I worked on, I, you know, when I worked on the Hill, I worked on the Subcommittee on Information Policy, which was, had jurisdiction over federal records, national archives, and all information policy of the U.S. government. So I had frequent briefings. I had a lot of uh, contact with the experts in the field, a lot of contact with the experts in the, the Government Accountability Office and the Congressional Research Service. I held three uh, congressional oversight hearings on federal electronic records. And I can give you a lot of examples of senior officials, of junior officials, of low-level employees using, again, occasionally, their personal email accounts. I know of no instance in the history of electronic uh, records where uh, an official used only a personal email account. And that is, to me, the crux of the problem. It wasn't the occasional use or, or the technical violation of the federal record. It was the complete and full violation of the Federal Records Act. It, there's no question. Wow. And it, so let, let, me, let me just make, make sure I completely understand this. So if you okay. got a, a personal email from anyone regarding any subject, that had to be forwarded to your federal No, account. I'm sorry. Let me make it clear. If you were using a personal email address or a personal email account in order to conduct federal business, gotcha. that document okay. had to be either forwarded or CC'd into the system as soon as possible. Okay, so if it was just you know me asking you, hey, let's go to dinner because I'm in Washington, not a problem. No, and in fact, when I was a congressional staffer, I was under the restriction that I couldn't conduct personal business, not just using the um, government systems, but I couldn't conduct personal business of any kind while on the property. Uh, uh, so when I was on the Rayburn building uh, up on the house, I couldn't you know uh, work on my book, for example. I had to go home and work on it. Or if I were working on a campaign, I could volunteer on a campaign or even get employed by a campaign, but I couldn't use government resources, government time, and government side. But in terms of the personal use of the email, yeah, it's frowned upon. You shouldn't be using government email for personal use. But if you use a personal email for government business, it has to be entered into the record. And see, that's, I think what's most important to note is because the, the, they recognize the occasional need or the occasional inability to access. You know, what, what if the servers were down for your agency, would, mm -hmm. would you be prohibited from conducting any business? No. But the key thing is get the record into the federal system for two reasons. One, so it's kept. But two, you as the record creator, you're not the person deciding whether it's kept or not. That's a decision made by records managers and later by archivists according to the law, people without a skin in the game. Fascinating. Well, and let, let's uh, so you so you think without question 
what what Mrs. Clinton has done is is beyond the pale. I, I would say that you know the, the best best way for me to describe it is that for a person who has undergone so much uh, scandal and has been the target of fair and unfair accusations, her attempt to control the record is understandable. But it doesn't. Make it, <laughs> but it doesn't. But it doesn't make it right. Very well put. <laughs> Right, it's understandable but not forgivable. How about how about that? There you go. That, that because, makes sense. I, I mean, one of the things, one of the questions I ask in the book is, does any of this matter? You know, does the does the conduct of federal officials past have any relation to the conduct of officials and presidents current and future? You know, does the record of what they did and what they didn't do and what they ought to have done and why make any difference in our lives? And if the answer is no, then we're wasting a lot of money. And a lot of effort trying to capture this and keep it and preserve it and make it available. You know, Anthony, you made a really interesting point about it. Obama could be the first one not to build a library. And it seems it's kind of an arms race here, right? I mean, no president's going to do that unless they see an example of somebody doing that. But it also reminds me, you know, I found in preparation for the show, I found a quote. And I'm happy to send this to you. I found this a great line. It's Grover Cleveland wrote a letter to somebody in April of 1889, and this was after he left the presidency for the second time, and he said this, and still the question, what shall be done with ex, with our ex-presidents is not laid at rest, and I sometimes think Henry Watterson's solution of it, take them out and shoot them, is worthy of attention. <laughs> now, Henry Watterson was the editor of the Louisville, Kentucky Courier Journal for 50 years, and he believed the country was not safe from any president while he was alive. He was especially worried about T.R., you know, <sighs> Theodore Roosevelt. But I, what is your ultimate reform? What would you like, if you could wave a magic wand, what would you want to happen with these presidential libraries now and into the future? Well, I've resisted the temptation to say, buy my book and find out. But I do have a section at the end of specific legislative proposals to clean up the system. And I think, here's a great example. Remember I told you we open the libraries after four years, but we don't open the records for, records for 100. Well, let's make a change in the law that says the National Archives can't open a presidential library and museum until 75% of the records are open. I think that you're going to see presidents and the National Archives get together with their private foundations and figure out a way to put the resources into preserving and making those records available pretty quickly, wouldn't you? Yes, absolutely. They couldn't, but, but more than that, if we can't get a handle on that, I think we have to divest ourselves of running these museums of, uh, of any kind. I, I think that we've had a debate, we've had many debates over decades as to whether or not we should preserve the records of the president, whether, whether we should pay our funds to keep those records. We've, we've had that debate. We have not had a debate as to whether or not we should be paying to host these skewed exhibits, these uh, public events. Here's a quick statistic. The Eisenhower Foundation tries to raise about $400,000 a year, and they give all of it to the National Archives carte blanche. They say, we support you however you want. You want to do this. You want to open records. You want to preserve artifacts. Do with what you want. The, the Reagan Library makes an average between 25 and $50 million a year, which is more than the cost to build a library every year. They raise it in the government building. They raise it because of the government building. And they're not obligated to give a single dollar of it to the government. Wow. Well, Anthony, thank you so much. This has been absolutely fascinating. And folks, again, get his book, The Last Campaign. And Anthony, where can people get your book? You can buy it on Amazon.com and CreateSpace.com right now. Fascinating stuff. Thank you so much for joining us on The Soul of Enterprise, Anthony. Thank you, Ron. Ed, what do we have up next week? Next week, Ron, is the end of the month, so we have our Free Rider Friday. Oh, fantastic. We've got so much stuff to talk about, especially with uh, some of Anthony's comments in here. It's been great. Uh, So I look forward to that, and I'll see you in 167 hours. This has been the Soul of Enterprise, business in the knowledge economy, sponsored by Sage, supporting small and medium-sized businesses by creating greater freedom for them to succeed. Join us next week on Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 1 p.m. Pacific. In the meantime, feel free to visit us at www.verisage.com slash T-S-O-E.
Thanks again for listening to the preceding program brought to you on the Voice America Business Channel. For more information about our network and to check out additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericabusiness.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the preceding program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management.